So welcome everyone to our service on Wales and Wonder. I'm going to begin as we always do here by lighting the chalice. So these words are by Reverend Ayanto Negroho. Um, he is the president of the Unitarian Christian Church of Indonesia. These are the International Council of Unitarians and Universalist Chalice Lighting Words for February 2021. We live in a time full of sorrow. Many people have lost their loved ones due to COVID-19. Many have lost their income because of the economic crisis or have become victims of natural disasters. Many people suffer because of conflict around the world. We live in a time of uncertainty. We don't know when the pandemic will truly end. We find it difficult to define the truth because hoaxes surround us. We question the honesty of our governments, empathy in our communities, the accuracy of our plans and truth in our faiths. We're at a crossroads, crossroads, either going deeper in losing hope or building stronger faith as we face the valley of darkness. We're at a time of examination, either living more egoistic lives to save our own selves or strengthening our community so we can survive together. We need the light, but do we have the discipline for spiritual works? Because sometimes it seems that all of our energy has run out to think, to work, to make income, and we don't have enough time. Then I see that when a storm tears down a big banyan tree, the same storm can't destroy a bamboo grove. I want to walk in the bamboo way because I don't want to stand alone in the middle of the storm. I choose to stay strong in faith, just as the bamboo has strong roots. I choose to renew my hope, just as there is flexibility in the bamboo. I choose to keep loving others, just as the bamboo grove survives together. Right now, three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And we're now going to have our second reading. Uh, this is a more modern one. Uh, from spiritual, from whales that appear in spiritual stories to real life whales, which have a habit of not doing what humans want them to do. Uh, this is a modern encounter with a humpback whale, uh, and it's called Close Call with a Humpback Whale. Uh, and the story was written by John Bantin, based on a tale told by another diver, Brett Gillam. And David is going to read it. Close Call with a Humpback Whale. Rarely would a mother and calf be seen without an escort male that takes responsibility for shepherding the pair safely, but woe betide the diver who dares to annoy the escort with aggressive behaviour. During his Navy diving days in 1971, Brett Gilliam had worked collecting data from fast attack nuclear submarines. It was in the superb visibility afforded by the waters off the US Virgin Islands. During the long underwater decompression stops required, he had often seen humpback whales. He became an enthusiastic humpback spotter, and this eventually led to 20 annual trips to the Silver Banks, an area between the Dominican Republic and Grand Turk. It's now an area well known among divers for encounters with humpback whales and their young calves. Standing on their tails and bobbing in the gentle evening sea, they positioned themselves with their heads turned to present eyes the size of hockey pucks that seemed to look right through you. At that point, the experience of swimming with our military subs seemed pretty pale by comparison. It was common to see pregnant females disappear and reappear a day or so later with a calf in tow but nobody has ever recorded a mother whale giving birth. Where they go to and how the birth is accomplished is still one of life's big mysteries. It was February 1993. The weather was not too good and it was extremely windy. Diving out in the open ocean was out of the question and for want of anything better to do, Brett left the boat and went alone for a shallow dive in the lee of a coral reef, swimming among the coral pillars that punctuated the sandy bottom. 
Even here, he could not escape the whale's presence, with their haunting songs flowing over and around the underwater landscape and filling his ears as he swam. He was very surprised indeed to round a coral head and come face to face with a mother whale and her calf. I was fewer than three metres from them, he recalled. What an opportunity for an underwater photographer. The whales were resting with the baby lying under its mother's watchful gaze. It was the smallest calf Brett had ever seen at around only two metres long and 110 kilograms. In fact, he remembered thinking it was about the same size and weight as himself. My mind was racing. Was this a newborn calf? Had I nearly stumbled on what every photographer in the world had sought for decades? Certainly the calf was the right size and clearly was so young that he couldn't hold his breath for more than a few seconds. I cradled my camera and began to line up the shots. Sure enough, the pair were waiting for me as I eased around the massive coral buttress into water that was now barely five metres deep. It was surreal to see this leviathan mother, some 15 metres in length, easing herself over the smooth sandy bottom. Her massive pectoral fins gently grazed the sand, leaving a trench marking her trail, while the baby rode the pressure wave just above her head. The depth lessened even more, and her belly barely cleared the bottom. I moved to the coral head and clung to an outcrop to let them pass, all the while firing away with my wide angle. As the mother's six meters tail fluke, sorry, as the mother's six meter tail fluke filled his lens from only inches away, Brett began a slow pursuit, but all the while wondering why there was no escort male supervising the pair. Maybe the rambunctious males were simply too cautious of the shallow water that might have stranded them. Brett was suddenly aware that the bottom was no longer five metres below him. His fin tips hit something solid when he kicked, and he looked down thinking he'd let himself drift onto the coral head. Wrong. The male I had been speculating about was directly below me, having been massed in the gloom before. He had now set his sights on moving up to place himself between his new family and me. He had accelerated his slow swim and I now found him about to surface directly between my legs. To my left were the jagged coral branches of the reef top and Mr Big chose that moment to raise his pectoral fin to just clear the hazard. His fin soared over the coral head like a stunt aeroplane turning around a coarse pylon. That effectively killed any escape in that direction. A quick look behind confirmed that the whale's back would make contact with me in seconds. I gulped a breath and dove over his head with my chest massaging his widow's peak on the way by. Finning to give us each some space, I ended up about one metre off the bottom and under his right pectoral fin. OK, this isn't so bad, I thought. He'll just glide over me and then I can come up. Wrong again. He chose that exact moment to stop and simultaneously dropped his pectoral fin, neatly pinning me to the sand. I had always wanted a close encounter, but this was ridiculous. There I was, flat on my back with several tons of deadweight pectoral gently anchoring me. I never even thought of struggling. I lay quietly and played dead. Rather aptly, I thought. From my constrained view, I could look the big guy in the eye from about 1.5 metres away. He articulated his gaze back to me and sized me up. After about 30 seconds, he eased up his pectoral fin and moved ahead. I put one hand up and fended myself off his belly as he moved over me at a snail's pace. Finally, the tail passed overhead and close enough to let me count the smallest barnacles. I gratefully hit the surface 
surface for some much needed air. While I was taking an inventory of my own body parts and mentally calculating if I qualified for hypoxia-induced brain damage, all three whales came at me from the shallows. The male led the mother and her baby deftly through the reef and then waited for them to exit to the deeper water. We regarded each other without malice as he ended up once again on the surface right next to me. I fired off a few frames and then he moved gradually away into the blue with his charges. Thank you very much, David. Very well read. And we will now have a prayer, uh, Prayers and Dreamings, by an American Unitarian author, Rebecca A. Edmiston Lange. Let us pray. Spirit within all, mysterious force giving shape to life, miraculous source and river of being, help us to know who we are, to see our place in the history of the earth and in the family of things. Help us to see that we are part of all that ever was, our grandmother's prayers and our grandfather's dreamings, our mother's courage and our father's hope. In our bones lie the calcium of antediluvian creatures. In our veins course the water of seas. We are part of all that ever was. Born of this earth, riders upon a cosmic ocean. We're not separate from nature, we are nature. Part of that same spirit that turns scales into feathers and birdsong into speech. We live by the sun, we move by the stars. We eat from the earth, we drink from the rain. O oh, Divine Spirit, help us to know who we are and fill us with such love for this holy creation and gratitude for this awesome gift we call living, that we might claim our inheritance and live out our calling to bless the world and each other with our care. May it be so. Amen. So, Wales. <laughs> Recently on the UK Unitarian Facebook page, someone posted the question, should worship involve the head, the heart or both? One of many responses to this question was from someone concerned uh, that there was a tendency, if we're not careful, to produce a themed lecture with some hymns. So I tried to bear that in mind when I put this together because I actually could do a lecture about whales. I could really just talk about them all morning because they're among the most wonderful creatures here on Earth. I could tell you that the beluga whale is known as the sea canary because of its song, or about the deep diving American whale, a new species that we discovered only a few weeks ago. But this time together is for our spirits as well as our minds. We've heard earlier about the role of the whale in the spiritual traditions of the Abenaki people of Canada. Uh, whales feature, feature often in the spiritual traditions of indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, world Whale Day originated in Hawaii in 1980. Uh, and has now spread around the world. Whales also appear in Hawaiian mythology. When I think about the Christian tradition I grew up with, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is probably a bit less optimistic. Uh, like lots of Sunday school kids, I spent a certain amount of time singing the song, Have You Heard the Tale of Jonah and the Whale Way Down at the Bottom of the Ocean? Uh, if you've heard me sing, be grateful I didn't just sing that. It's the most famous whale in the Bible, spoiled only slightly by the fact that it's as likely to be a giant fish as a whale, depending on your translation. Also by the fact that uh, those of us who were a bit older and had started studying biology realised that whales were not actually hollow like the whale in Disney's Pinocchio, and that getting swallowed by a whale would be really unpleasant. Uh, less fun fact about sperm whales, uh, they're the only creatures on Earth capable of swallowing an adult human being whole. Jonah's prayer is one of the most powerful expressions of faith in, in the face of despair and hopelessness in the Bible. When he was cast overboard by the sailors of the ship he was travelling on, who were terrified of the storm he brought on them by disobeying God, he was followed by the whale and prayed, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. For you cast me deep in, into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. The waters closed over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the foot of the mountains. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. 
Salvation belongs to God. And then God spoke to the whale and it vomited Jonah out onto the dry land. There's another mysterious whale creature in the Bible, Leviathan. Leviathan appears in part God's reply to Job's complaint. Uh, those who know the story will remember that Job was a man who had enjoyed great good fortune in his life until God tested his faith by permitting Satan to take away his riches, his family and his health. Job originally remains faithful to God, but at the end he complains at this injustice, uh, saying, I say to God, do not declare me guilty, but tell me what charges you have against me. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands while you smile on the plans of the wicked? When I was younger, I found God's reply really hard to read because it's not comforting at all. God doesn't explain anything to Job, but says in essence, the human mind can't hope to understand the ways of the creator. Part of God's reply is to say, can you pull in the Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Can you fill its hide with harpoons or its head with fishing spheres? Who then is able to stand against me? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. Once again, it's an ambiguous biblical whale. And while Leviathan these days is a term often used to refer to whales, a lot of people translate it actually as a crocodile. Never mind. As an adult, I still don't find the Book of Job comforting, but I do find it closer to my own views on spirituality. We know now that our own universe contains many mysteries we do not understand. We can't touch dark matter. We can't see infrared or ultraviolet. Humans can hear only part of the whale's song. We can't hear the lowest of the whale frequencies. The lowest we can hear is about 100 hertz. Whales can sing as low as 30. And whales themselves are mysterious and powerful creatures. One of the most famous of all, Moby Dick, is a source of terror for the whaling crews trying to kill him. Captain Ahab, who swears revenge on the whale for biting off its leg, is simultaneously enraged by it and fascinated. At one point he sees the whale and replies, Speak, thou vast and venerable head. Speak, mighty head, and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. Of all divers, thou hast gone the deepest. That head on which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid this world's foundations. Thou hast been where bell or diver never went, has slept by many a sailor's side. O oh, head, thou hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of Abraham, but not one syllable can you speak. I believe that the Book of Job, the point made there and here by Melville, of the otherworldliness to humans of the whale's habitat reminds us that we're parts of the world, but we're not the point of it. The nice idea that it was created especially for our benefit is one that's just got to go. When we ditch the idea that humans are the centre of the world, we become closer to understanding ourselves and it. And we also see whales more closely. Where we previously saw monsters or dumb animals that should be exploited for lamp oil and ribs for corsets, we see what might be the closest thing to an alien intelligence we are likely to encounter any time soon, except perhaps, uh, perhaps the octopus or squid. Makes you wonder, what's it like to be a whale? What's it like to have a body the size of a ship with arteries a human could swim through? What's it like to find your food by echolocation and not sight? to continually be bathed in sound, communicating all the time, always with your family and fellows, even if physically they aren't there with you. And whales also remind us of our unhappy power to cause immense destruction in the natural world. Humans have hunted whales for almost as long as we've existed, and that was understandable when we needed to survive. There is a great difference though between a tradition of occasionally killing whales, one or two, which for many indigenous cultures is a spiritual tradition, not carried out lightly. And the whole scale industrial slaughter of them that our species has gone in for over the past couple of centuries. Founder of the Sea Shepherd activist group, Captain Paul Watson wrote this poem, Primate Monsters of the Deep. Intelligence willfully destroyed to, be, to read books, Moby Dick read by the light of burning whales. Without a thought, blind to the connections by death's bright might, is read another book. Thou shalt not kill, is one of the lying tales. We define what is right by bias selections. Still more horrifying is the unthinking harm we can do. 
Nobody here intended to fill the oceans with plastic or make them so noisy with the sounds of our gigantic boats, oil rigs and submarines that it's hard for sea creatures to communicate with each other. Yet, many of us were moved to tears by David Attenborough's documentary showing a mother whale mourning the loss of her calf, which probably died through ingesting milk filled with plastic and chemicals. I don't claim that I've got an easy answer to any of these problems. I don't think anyone has, but I also don't want to counsel despair. People can change. We've recently seen huge campaigns to limit single use plastics and clear up litter. Wind power is likely to become the main source of power here in this country over the next few decades. Humans can go to great lengths to protect living beings as well as to harm them. Through knowing our fellow creatures better, we come to know our world and ourselves better. One final story. Nearly five years ago, I dived on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Uh, as I surfaced from my dive, one of the boat crew approached me and said quietly, take off your diving jacket, but keep your wetsuit and fins, put on a snorkel and get back in the water. There are five minky whales swimming behind the boat. Uh, if you've seen the order of service or the picture I put on Facebook, uh, that was one of the whales. I hung in the water behind the boat, watching the whales swimming back and forth and hurriedly, totally at ease in their own element. One whale was accompanied by a much smaller minky whale, which I suspect was the whale equivalent of a teenage whale. As the two patrolled up and down, it was hard not to imagine the older whale pointing a fin at me and saying to the younger one, and these funny looking things that think they can swim are called humans. You shouldn't anthropomorphize too much, but as I looked into the whale's eyes, I knew there were fellow minds looking back at me. Then they departed into the blue. And now our final prayer. I have put out our chalice, but whilst the physical flame is out, its light remains within us until we are able to gather once more. And here are our closing words. Let our lives be a prayer by Reverend Joel Miller. Let our lives be a prayer that waters dry souls, mends broken hearts, refuses to be terrorised, seeks this world's beauty and carries us safely through its storms. May it be so. Amen.